Are we smarter than the dinosaurs? I asked this question to my kids, ages four, six, and eight, while we were watching one of their favorite shows, Dinosaur Train. My daughter, the oldest, loves to sound mature, and she said, of course we are, Daddy. We're more intelligent because we live in houses and we drive minivans. <laughs> my sons, they started hysterically laughing, and one of them said, they had little brains. And the other one said, I think they ate each other. <laughs> Oddly, not one of them said anything about asteroids. So I'm a policy analyst, and I've spent a lot of time over the past few years thinking about asteroids and the threat that they may pose to our planet. It's very likely that the dinosaurs did not consider this prior to a six-mile-wide object traveling at 67,000 miles per hour, 67,000 miles per hour, slammed into the Earth, generating a crater 110 miles wide and changing every ecosystem on the planet. So this is Buddy. Buddy is a main character on Dinosaur Train, and he's drawn here by Craig Bartlett, the creator of the show, and he drew him for this talk. I asked Craig to put him in a modern-day scene, and you can see that he's well-equipped with an iPad, an iPhone, a computer. I think that's a minivan in the driveway. <laughs> but surely if Buddy had had the tools and technologies that we have today, he would have fared better, right? Well, maybe not, but before I get into that, let me tell you a little bit about asteroids. So, in our solar system, there we go. In our solar system, asteroids reside between Mars and Jupiter in a belt called the asteroid belt. And when two of these objects collide with one another, they create baby asteroids. And all of that, each of them have their own orbits that may or may not come to pass Earth's path. Now, asteroids are kind of like snowflakes in the sense that they're very unique, not one is like the other, and they come in all shapes and sizes. Now, astronomers have been looking at asteroids for centuries. But only recently did we start surveying the sky to try to really understand how many of the different threatening bodies there were. So here you can see there's, there's the one kilometer and larger set. They pose the, most, or they pose the most threat. Then there's the less than one kilometer across to 140 meters, and then there's the smaller than 140 meters. And of the big ones, there's about 1,000 that could come to pass Earth. Of the middle ones, about 20,000. And of the small ones, about a million. We can see more than 90% of the big ones, about 10% of the middle ones. And while the small ones, we don't worry about the small ones. No, the small ones, we um, really don't see them. Uh, they don't reflect a lot of light, and it hasn't been a priority for us. But let me tell you about two small ones that, oh, and there they are. Let me tell you about two small ones that really changed our uh, world on February 15th of this year. So on February 15th, there was an asteroid 150 feet wide that crossed by Earth. Now, it did not enter the atmosphere, but it did come closer than a lot of our communication satellites. So while people like me were transfixed on this object, another one snuck in, and it was a 60-foot wide object. It's about 20 meters. It would barely have fit in this room. And it entered the atmosphere and exploded 14 miles above the ground in rural Russia. Now, when it exploded, it shot forth four to five, kilo, four to five hundred kilotons of energy, which is tens of times greater than the atomic weapons used in World War II. And the resulting damage was uh, to buildings and about 1,500 people. It turns out that the people who were hurt, um, they weren't hurt because they were thrown or whatnot. They were hurt because they did what all of us would do. They walked to the window when they saw this huge flash in the sky, which was many times brighter than the sun, and light travels faster than the shock wave. So they're standing there right in harm's way as the shock wave hit the glass and exploded. So we actually kind of got lucky with this object. It came in, as you can see, at a kind of a horizontal angle. If that angle had been a bit more vertical, then it could have thrust the energy down straight at the ground, and you could have found something that was a little bit more like this 1908 event, which leveled 80 million trees and generated a 5.0 magnitude earthquake. Mm. If it had been a bit more dense and actually impacted the ground, you could have expected something on the order of meteor crater. I'm sure some of you have seen this in life. It's about three quarters of a mile wide, 
600 feet deep. Just imagine if either of these two scenarios that I just suggested were to happen in a populated place like Los Angeles. Now, many of you are probably thinking, but Bill, we've got the tools, we've got the technologies. Well, it turns out that we don't. And if, I don't know if you're keeping score out there, but that's dinosaurs and humans equal. <laughs> Sorry. So, let me tell you a little bit about this. So, when these events in February happened, the popular media, they started profiling the potential tools that we have for planetary defense. And, you know, they sound really great. I mean, blast it with a nuclear weapon, run a spacecraft into it, um, paint it so that the sun, you know, the sun's rays will gently float it out of the way. Um, the problem is, is that a lot of these concepts are just that, concepts. And what was left out was the fact that it'll take years or even decades to, de to develop them to something that we could actually use. Now, I have a little bit of experience in this. I used to design satellites and lasers uh, for the government. I was uh, in the Air Force. And I mean, we were lucky if very complex programs took decades. So some of you are probably thinking, Bill, the first example you gave, that was a nuclear weapon. We have nuclear weapons. Well, yeah, they've been around for decades, but it turns out that the nuclear weapons that we have, they weren't built for this problem. They were built to hit static targets on the ground. They weren't built to hit big rocks flying through space at tens of thousands of miles per hour. So, how do we not end up like Buddy? <laughs> There's actually things that we can do today, and it is not a all is lost scenario. So every day I get a chance to work in multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary tools. And the really amazing thing about doing that is that you get a chance to look at the entirety of a complex problem instead of only having to focus in on that one little thing that you can dig into deeply because of your expertise. You can leverage the creativity and experience of your colleagues, of your friends, of your community. Let me give you a practical example. So the Apollo program, do you think we could have made it to the moon and back with just rocket scientists and engineers? I mean, what would the astronauts have eaten? <laughs> How would they have known that they could stay in that small capsule for days on end? In fact, we needed nutritionists and physiologists and psychologists and a bunch of other ists and ologists to work, <laughs> to work with those rocket scientists and engineers to get us to the moon and back. It was not a one-dimensional problem, and neither is that of planetary defense. Now, I've had the good fortune of working with the planetary defense community over the past few years, and it is an amazing group of people, that, about 1,000 people globally, and they come from the backgrounds of astronomy, engineering, astrophysics, mathematics. And it's occurred to me recently that, is it really fair? Is it fair that we've taken this a planetary defense mission and just burdened only their shoulders with it? I mean, we definitely want them to build the tools. We definitely want them to calculate the risk. But one would imagine we'd want sociologists and psychologists to think about how do you handle public anxiety? You'd want educators and artists to figure out how do you render the steps that the public needs to take so that the public takes the right steps when an event occurs say, stand away from the windows. Political scientists, economists, to think about the framework that this global problem will require for us to solve it. So, are we smarter than the dinosaurs? It turns out it's a little bit of a good news, bad news story. <laughs> the good news is we are definitely more intelligent. And my daughter, when I told her this, she was ecstatic to find out she was right. <laughs> the bad news is that we are just as vulnerable as they were to asteroids. Now, we do have the advantage of knowing what happened to them, so we can use that as a forcing function. And it's gonna take a lot of work. I mean, we do need to build the tools. I'm not advocating against that. But what I am advocating for is that this community, this community that's looking at planetary defense, become more broad, become more diverse, that we collectively, I mean, many of you in this room could probably contribute to it, you just haven't thought about it yet. That we collectively think about the risk to our planet posed by asteroids. Because like it or not, we live in a very, very busy neighborhood. And it's called the solar system. And sooner or later, these asteroids will come to call. 
It's our choice whether or not we collectively choose to prepare. Thank you.